This is the New Life Rancho Vista podcast. We are a church committed to loving God, growing together, and serving others. Our prayer and desire is that this message from our campus pastor, Peter Moore, will be a help and an encouragement to you, regardless of where you are in your relationship with Jesus. So let's open our hearts and minds as we turn our attention to the incredible truths God has for us today. In Immutable One, we, we surveyed the first six chapters of Hebrews, and uh, we understood that Jesus uh, brings power, immutable power. Uh, Jesus brings immutable ways, promises. Uh, we, we talked about the immutability of his uh, identity he gives to us, his hope, and so if you want to listen to those, they're online. But now we're launching into the second half of the book, and it gets really practical. And so the first half of the book, we talked about the immutability of God, and, and now we're going to talk about the fact that I am mutable. And next week, if, you, if you're able to be here, I have a massive remote with a big mute button on it, and I'm going to teach you how to mute the lies we tell ourselves, because the reality is no one lies more to me than I do. No one lies more to you than you do. And so Hebrews chapter 7 this morning, Hebrews chapter 7, we're going to dip back into chapter 6 for a bit, and and then next week we're going to look at a little bit more of chapter 7 and then chapter 8. But we're going to talk about muting religion. And I know that sounds like an awkward topic for being in a church, but let me just say something about religion for a minute. Religion lies to us, By saying or assuming or acting like you can fix yourself or that religion or the system of religion can fix you. Because no system or or no, um, you know, three-step fix or no self-help theory or formula can fix you. And the sooner we realize that, the better. And so... Hebrews chapter 7 is demonstrating how Jesus is far better, he's far greater than the religious system that the Jews were facing. Now we know this was written to the Jews because it's just assuming that the people who were listening to this or, or, or reading this knew the Torah. And the Torah was given to uh, the Jews first, but then also to all of us as God's words to men. And uh, this book of Hebrews was penned I believe by Paul, at the latest, uh, it was penned about 68 AD, and it was written to this this group of, of, of Jews at the time, they were Jewish Christians who really were confused, they thought, well, maybe I should go back to Judaism, uh, in the religious system of Judaism, or maybe I should just really believe that Jesus can help me through my difficulties, and he was saying, Uh, Paul, I believe, and it it might have been a different writer, but he was saying, no, I I want you to hold fast to the faith because Jesus is the forerunner. He's going before you, before your tribulations, before your trials, before you ever knew that this was going to happen. He was already there. And in fact, I want you guys to put up the last two verses of chapter 6 because it makes chapter 7 make sense. And it says this in chapter 6 and verse number 19, which hope we have as an anchor for the soul. Now you can anchor your soul to anything, but all things are going to move unless it's Jesus, because Jesus is steadfast and sure, which entereth in within the veil. So they had a religious system with a veil, and no one could go into the Holy of Holies. But let me just say this morning that you can enter into the presence. And by the way, by being in this place right here, right now, you have entered into the presence of Almighty Creator God. Because the veil has been torn down. And we talked about that in the last message of Immutable. You can go back and listen to that. Then he says that the forerunner is for us entered. Even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Then let's look at, uh, let's look at chapter 7. Chapter 7 verses 1 and 2 says this. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, or the Jews would say Abraham, a, a returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation the king of righteousness, and after also the king of Salem, which is 
king of peace. So it's saying that Jesus is like or the same as this man called Melchizedek. Now I believe that Melchizedek was an actual person, an actual priest, but I believe that he was a representation of another king, a king of kings that would come and would bring a solution that religion, the 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 Aaron, uh, you know, and Levites, the, the, the priesthood of Aaron and the Levites could not bring the solutions that Jesus would bring. And so there are two miracles that Jesus brings that religion can't bring. Religion can bring a lot of rituals. Religion can bring a lot of, a, a lot of good practices. Religion can bring a lot of traditions. But really, when it comes right down to it, a relationship with Jesus Christ is the best solution. And so, when we come to a passage like this, we need to ask ourselves, okay, well then who was Melchizedek? Do we need to understand who Jesus was? Who was Melchizedek? Well, here's who he was, and this is what the passage says. Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High, but the word Melchizedek, okay, is is talking about the holiness. We'll talk about that in a minute, but it's also talking about peace. He was the king of peace. Salem was an actual uh, place at that point, but it was also meaning, when they say shalom, okay, it's from the same root word as Salem, and the word mal, malk, and then sadiq, so Melchizedek, it literally means king, mal, and then sadiq is the Hebrew word for holy or righteous. And the word righteous or justice is one of the most important words in the Bible because it is God's standard for who receives judgment and who receives grace. And so once we understand that, we can come back to the passage and ask five questions. So don't lose me on these five questions because I think that if I read, and I would encourage you as your homework, you know, to read this entire chapter before we survey it next week, but let me just tell you, if you read the entire chapter of, se- of, of Hebrews, se- um, Hebrews 7, you'll, you'll come up with these five questions. Maybe a different version of them, but you'll come up with these five questions. Here's the questions you'll ask. You ask, how can Jesus claim to be a priest and a king at the same time? How, how in the world can he do that? And, and it's because he's from the order of Melchizedek, but he's also born of Judah. He's also in the line of David. And so if Jesus is a king in the line of David, then why didn't he sit on a throne? And, and the answer to that is he's coming to sit on a throne, friend. He's offering his kingdom to you and to me. And he says that in his, in his word. Jesus said that multiple times as well. And so then we, we have to ask when we read this, this passage, if religion wasn't broken, then why did Jesus come to fix it? Listen, if, if, if religion can offer all of the solutions and the confessions and, and, and the incense and, and the if you do this or if you go here or if you uh, do this pilgrimage or if you do all of these things, if you do, 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 then... And Jesus says, no, it's done. Jesus says, no, I've, I've done it. I, I came, I fixed the broken religious system, and I shed my own blood. And so if Jesus came as a priest then, if, if, if he's also a priest, then why didn't he work in the temple? If he came as the great high priest, then why didn't they let him in the temple? And the reality was that he came as a different priest. He did not come as an earthly priest offering earthly solutions. He came as a heavenly priest offering heavenly solutions. And let me just tell you, what does this have to do with you today? That's the fifth question. It has to do everything because he is the king of your life. And one day you will admit that. And one day you will come to grips with that. And every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord he is the king but let me just tell you it goes a step further that not only is he king he's also the great high priest meaning he offered the ultimate sacrifice to pay for your sin to pay for what I did this last week that was wrong to pay for all of our transgressions, uh, past, present, and future. He was the ultimate sacrifice. And, and, and I say what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus. He said, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away. He does not hide it. He does not try to push it off to the side like religion does. He says, I am going to take away the sin of the world. 
And so there's two miracles that I want you to see through these two roles that Jesus had that Melchizedek represented, uh, the, the king of peace, the king of righteousness. Let's look at these two miracles that he does in your life, and, and we'll look at them briefly, but, I, but I, I want you to get these two, okay? The first thing is as priest and king, Jesus, okay, only Jesus can give us peace. Only Jesus can give us peace. Now, now you might have you might have your you might have your area, okay? And I say area because you know people say, "Oh, that's my happy place," <laughs> right? You know, that's my happy place. You know, no, 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 you can't come in. You can, mom, mom's in her happy place, okay? No, 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 no. Noise can stay out there, but 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 I need a place of peace. <laughs> I need some peace and quiet. How many of you have ever had a moment where you were like, "No, I need some peace and quiet right now." I mean, I just need some time to think. In a loud and crazy world, we're all beg. Our souls are begging for peace, and the only one. Now you can get temporary peace. Okay, you can move over to Tibet and be in a, in, a, in a Buddhist monk. And I talked to a, a lady who spent a year in a Buddhist uh, a monastery over in Tibet. And, 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 and she said uh, that, that she had to leave. She had to leave. She, 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 she couldn't because, because when she slowed down and she started to think, uh, her, her thoughts, she, she was locked inside a prison of her thoughts. And nothing that the monks told her made it, made it any better. And I actually felt bad for her. But let me just tell you something. The reality is you can seek peace anywhere, but you can only find in the prince of peace, yea, the king of peace, the king of Salem, the king of Shalom. And so Jesus gives peace. Well, let's see from this passage how, how that happens, okay? Well, first letter A, you see that peace with God is profitable. It is profitable, And the peace of God is profitable both for you and for me. Now, religion might be profitable for a while, but religion in the end is not profitable. Religion in the end actually uh, becomes a trap. And it's one of the reasons when I was 17, I didn't want anything to do with church or religion. And I I desperately wanted to prove my parents wrong, uh, that what you believe is a lie. Because I believed that religion, they were telling lies. And I was right. But we have to come back and we have to ask ourselves, what is profitable? Now I saw a church sign that said this. And, and uh, I don't know if this is good theology or not. But it said that God expects spiritual fruit, not religious nuts. Now when we talk about religion being unprofitable, I I really am talking about people who have really started to emphasize things that are not in the Bible at all. And so I grew up in a church that was really good. There were good people doing good things for for a good reason. But let me just tell you something. They were relying on those good things to make them good and not on a good person who came down from heaven with a heavenly solution. Friend, it, it, it was just a religious exercise, not a relationship with the Redeemer Himself. And so the only profitable peace is from God. Now let's look at this in verse number 16. Verse number 16, and again, uh, you the questions that I asked earlier are kind of the questions that Paul asked, and you can read through verses 3 through verses 15, and you can see exactly that the questions I asked earlier are the questions he's answering in those passages. So I feel, feel free to read that on your own, but let me just pick up in verse 16 for sake of time. Who is made not after the law of the carnal commandment, like Aaron was. I mean, it was a carnal commandment. I mean, come on, guys. They were taking off their clothes and, 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 and making idols and then saying that they just kind of popped out of the fire. Really? Okay, so uh, after the power of, uh, but after a power of endless life, meaning, listen, the life that you're seeking, okay, the, the life of, of fulfillment and joy and empowerment, uh, that, that only comes from Jesus because his is endless life. So we talked about that a little last week, that there's, there's sources of that that are, are only temporary. For he testifies, thou, by the way, this is David in Psalm 110, thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek, 
For there is verily a uh, disannulling of the commandment going before the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. So religion is unprofitable ultimately. For the law made nothing perfect. It actually, the law, the Torah actually shows you how you can't be good. It actually shows you that you, you can't do it on your own, that you actually need a greater priest, a, a, a greater sacrifice. And so, it, it does nothing. But the bringing in of a better hope did. The bringing home of what? A better hope. Let's say that together. A better hope. Let's say it again. A better hope. Let me just tell you something, that there's a better hope which we have when we, what? Draw nigh to God. When we draw nigh to who He is and we draw nigh to what He actually wants us to do. And He's not wanting uh, you to just do a religious exercise. And I, I'm glad you're here today, but n- sitting in these chairs will not draw you closer to God if you don't make a decision to say no. I'm not just going to be here so that others see or, or so that I feel better about myself. No, I, I am going to live the life that God's called me to live because in drawing nigh to God, there's a better hope, there's a better life, there's a greater, more profitable peace. So last week I talked about shoveling snow. And some of you walked up to me and said, listen, I'm, I grew up in snow, I know how to shovel snow. And, and I want you to know that one of the greatest things that you need when you shovel snow is, is good footwear. In fact, this is what happens when you don't have the proper footwear and try to shovel snow. <laughs> now, I'm thankful this guy didn't fall. But let me just tell you that this in a 10 second clip is religion because you are trying to stay on your feet but your feet are not shod with the preparation of the gospel of what peace and the peace of God is the footwear and when Paul was saying to the church at Ephesus you got to have the right footwear if you're if you're putting on slick kicks you're it's not going to cut it let me just tell you you need to put on the 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 shoes of peace i just untied my shoes right when i said shoes i i don't think i could do that again in a thousand tries if i if i if i did that so my mother-in-law bought these shoes for me i wasn't planning on saying this but the first time I put them on, I thought I was going to take them back. And then I tried to take them back, and they said, oh, you're past the 90 days. And I said, well, they fit great. Um, <clears throat> well, let me just tell you something. Religion tries to put you in shoes that were never meant for you. Religion tries to take you out of the role of subservient to Jesus and place you into the, into the role as the one that is adding on. I keep untying my shoes. Adding on to what Jesus did. You know, I ask a lot of people this. I ask a lot of people the question. If Jesus paid it all and he said it's finished, and then you have to do something in addition to that to get yourself to heaven or forgiveness or whatever. And you do that, aren't you just adding to what he said was enough? Aren't you just adding to, to the sacrifice that he said was complete? In fact, aren't we saying in religion that if you have to do something to work your way to heaven, aren't we actually saying that Jesus didn't do enough? Aren't we actually saying that, that, that in our actions we're, we're actually bringing up the last 10% or whatever you want to say? And so peace is only profitable if we realize that we are completely unprofitable. We need it. We're, we're deficient. And so in this passage, he's telling us, that, th- that, it's, that it's profitable. Now, I love this passage because uh, uh, Psalm 29, 11 says this, The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Now, notice it doesn't say that the Lord will bless his people with peace if... And religion adds a comma where God put a period. And religion says, dot, 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 you have to, or if you, 
do this, then no, no, no. You don't understand. Agape love is unconditional, friend. He loves you more than he's ever loved you before. He he cannot love you any less. And so he's calling to you saying, my peace is profitable. But then look at letter B. Not only is his peace profitable, but his peace is possible. You know what breaks my heart is I meet teenagers. I, I, I met a teenager this week and, 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 and never been to church and never read the Bible. And I, I just said, I, I said, this is what the Bible says. And, and, and they just looked at me with, with this look like, why, has no, why are you the first person to tell me this? Well, why, why it's been possible this whole time for me to overcome these, these thoughts of suicide and depression. And it's been possible and no one cared enough to share. So friend, today it's possible. And I want you to see this in verse number 24. Actually, verse number, let's go to verse number 26 where we left off. We read verse 25. It says this. You guys want to go to verse 20? Let's go to verse 26 to the end if you have it. If not, uh, I'll, I'll read it from here. Verse number 26 of, of Hebrews 7 says this. Verse 26 says, For such a high priest became us. He became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made a little uh, made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those who offer the sacrifice first for his own sins and then the people's sins. For once, for he did once, then offered up himself. Now let me just tell you something about verse 26 and 27 there. Every year, they would have to bring in the animal and they'd say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. And they would place the animal and then they would kill the animal. And, and, and the sins that, that, were, that were committed that year would go on the blood of that animal and that would, that would be okay for the next year. Every year, killing animals. Jim, you're back again. You know, Susie, what are you doing? Come on, killing animals. And Jesus said, enough. Let the animals live because I'm, I'm going to come as the lamb. The reason why that's possible peace is I want to I tell you something about the peace of Jesus. That the peace of Jesus comes not from man's words, but from God's presence. I want you to see this in, in, in his love. I want you to see there's two passages that I want you to see before we go on to the next point. The, the first passage is Romans 8. Now, we went through Romans 8 uh, about a year ago. I want you to see Romans 8, 32. He says, he spared not his own son, that's God, but delivered him up for us all. How shall not with him also freely give us all things? He's asking like, I mean, come on, he gave us his son and he's not going to help you with your situation? He, no, 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 he's going to help you. He's going to be there for you. Who shall lay anything at the charge of God's elect? Who, it is God that justifieth. I can't as a man say, you're condemned, you're condemned, you're condemned, you're good. No, you're not good at all. <laughs> but you're okay. I give you like a 90%. I mean, who? God's the one that justifieth. We're not here to judge one another. God's the ultimate judge. And so, he that justifies, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. He maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Do you know it's interesting that God uh, tells us through his son what he did? He did this. And look at John chapter, we always say John 3.16. Look at the next verse. A lot of people don't ever quote this. For God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but, through, but that the world through him might be saved. You see, we're in an age of grace. God's offering you grace. He's offering you peace. He wants to, he wants to give you peace. And people say, oh, God's up there with that big hammer and the lightning rod, and he's coming after me. Let me just tell you something about God. God offered his son 
not to give you a lightning rod, but to give you a lift out of your sin. And he that believeth on him is not condemned. Uh, He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because we're condemning ourselves. We condemn ourselves. We know what's wrong and right. God's built that into us, Romans 1 says. So because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You want to know how to connect with God? Believe on the only Son of God. That's the name above all names. And so here's the key thought. Here's the key thought. Jesus didn't come to help you with your sin. He didn't just come to help you. He came to heal you from your sin. And peace is just saying, God, can you help me with this sin problem? Uh, You know, uh, peace is not found by just asking God to help. Peace is found by saying, God, can you heal me from this sin problem? Can you come and transform me from the inside out? Now, how does that happen? Well, number two, and then we're done. Number two, only Jesus can make us right. So only Jesus can give us peace, but then number two, only Jesus can make us right. Now, I want you to see verse number 28. This is remarkable. Verse 27 and 28. Guys, put that passage up that you had before. It says this. He says, so, so he offered up, you know, once he offered himself up, verse 27, we read that. But look at verse 28. This is remarkable. For the law, that's representing religion, by the way. The law brings you, t- it, it'll show you why you're a sinner. In fact, I love the word Heathen. <laughs> Yeah, you're not just a sinner. You're a heathen. Okay, all right. It means the same thing, but regardless, all right? For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. That's the inward weakness, the inward sin. But the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son who is consecrated forevermore. What's that mean? Well, let's look at this, okay? First of all, this means, or letter A, the new guarantee from God is grace. So what it's saying about the law, what it's saying about the oath, what it's saying about the consecrated, set apart, like bound by his, by his name, bound by who he is, he's saying, I'm making a new guarantee through Jesus, and after Jesus dies, Listen, this is the promise. No longer is it the land, the seed, the blessing. No longer is the old covenant, or oh, by the way, the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the old testimony that God said, I will be true to my word. The old covenant was with a nation. The new covenant is with all people who believe. The new covenant, the new oath, the new testament is the new testament of his blood that was shed to say, I love you and I want you to receive grace for your sin. And this is why my life verse is 2 Corinthians 5, 21. By far my favorite verse. In fact, I'll just throw it out there. It should be your life verse. <laughs> it is the greatest life, it is the greatest verse in the Bible. Now, if you have another life verse, I was just halfway kidding, but I, no, really, you should consider it because here's why. Verse 20 in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians says this. Be reconciled unto God. It's a commandment. It's saying, be reconciled unto God. And you say, how in the world can I, have that pe- can I be at peace with God? How can I be right with God? How can me and God be good? And I hear people all the, all the time who say, uh, me and the guy upstairs, we're just not good right now. Well, l- let me just tell you something. He- he's not just a guy who's really like distant out there, like, like some religions talk. Guess what? God's up close and personal. And here's what God's trying to say to everyone in this room, including to me. Listen, you want to be right with me? you got to go through my son. Because he's the one making intercession for you, as our passage says. He's the one that, that, that's calling out to you. Now, now, here's what verse 21 says. For he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin for us to be sin for you and for me who knew no sin. Jesus did not know sin. He was the only one qualified to put righteousness on our soul, to stamp our soul with his blood righteous that we might be made, we might be transformed from the inside out. The righteousness of God, not just outside of him, that's what religion says, but inside of him. And so there's a new guarantee in the Bible, and the guarantee is grace. And so, 
we see that it's not just a guarantee of grace. The key to grace is faith. The key to grace is faith. That's letter B. Now, Ricardo, bring a few chairs up here. Bring four, actually. So I'm going to set up three chairs, and I'm going to, I'm going to show you uh, how we vacation. Okay, the last thing, and then we'll go. All right, so I'm almost done. We vacationed every year. We would go all over the country, but we would vacation in a 1987 Astro van. And we got it brand new. And, and let me just tell you something. That this van, this isn't the exact van. I didn't have, have a, a, a high-resolution high picture. If you want to just put one back here and then three up here, that'd be perfect. So this was exactly the, the make and model of the van. This one has cooler rims uh, than our van had. But this is the van I grew up traveling in. And, and actually, we put 700,000 miles on this Astro van on one engine. My dad took care of it. And he found out, actually, after 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 finally it, it died, that if he would have gone to a million, that Chevy would have given him a brand new one. I didn't know that. But I don't know if they still do that, but a million miles. We put so many miles on that thing. But there were six kids. There were six kids in my family. I'm one of six. I'm the oldest boy. And the boys always had to be in the back, okay? And the girls were in the front. So here's the girls, okay, in the front bench. There's another bench behind it. Here's the boys. So I'm the oldest boy. My, my brothers are like eight or ten uh, years younger than me. And so I'm sitting in the back. And my brother is sitting next to me, okay? He's about the, the, the size and, and age of my youngest son, Chandler, who's six. And he's sitting there, and he's sucking on a lollipop. And we're there, and we're, 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 we're he's blue lollipop. And I look over, and not only is his tongue blue, not only are, are his lips blue, but his entire face is blue. And I'm like, what kind? Where'd you get that? Like the Oompa Loompa factory? Or I mean, what's. And I realized that the, the sucker had come off the stick. And the sucker had been, lo- it's, it had been lodged for a minute, okay, in his throat, and he couldn't breathe. And he's sitting there going like this. And I'm like, stop, stop hitting me, stop hitting me. And he couldn't breathe. And so as the hero big brother that I am, I freaked out. And I didn't just freak out. I actually actually said, Dad, pull over. JJ's choking. And I threw him. I unbuckled him. And I threw him up. But I didn't throw him far enough. So he actually hit the front of the seat. And it was like the perfect accidental Heimlich uh, maneuver only I shouldn't have told this right before our barbecue I just hit this but but let me just say more than the sucker came out all over my three sisters I loved that I loved that because it wasn't me I was the hero that saved his life, albeit accidentally. If I, by the way, I've never told my sisters that that was an accident. I probably should. But, but, but I just threw them, you know, and, and they're like, whoa, there's, you know, it was, it was messy. We had to, you know, go and clean everything out. And, and uh, my brother and I, to this day, have an inseparable bond. Um, he's, a, he, he, he's a youth pastor down in San Diego, but let me just tell you something. Jesus didn't come to accidentally save you. Jesus came because there was the lollipop of sin lodged in your soul so tightly that you couldn't get it out. And and religion says, oh, let us help you with that. And do you know what literally happens when they try to help you? They put all of the other things that God has put into place to remove sin from you, his son, his sacrifice, they add on to it. You know what my brother didn't need? My brother didn't need another lollipop. My brother didn't need to feel better. My brother didn't need just a few steps to try to get it out. No, my brother needed divine intervention. 
And my friend, if, you, if you've never realized that you had a sin problem that cannot be cured by any human means, you need Jesus to come and to be your Savior from the sin. And let me just tell you why most religions uh, and why we need to mute the, 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 the lies of religions. Here's why I don't subscribe to a religious religiosity. Here's why we're not a part of a denomination. Here's why I don't believe in, in religious rituals just for the sake of religious rituals. Here's why we only only hold to the truths of the Bible, here's why, is because when we understand that Jesus came not just to make us happy, but to make us whole, we can realize, and here's the key thought, here's the key thought, that God's grace is the greatest gift ever given, but a gift is only valuable to those who receive it. You know, one of the greatest gifts I ever gave my brother, I did accidentally. I, 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 I saved his life. He was panicking. But I, I want you to know that, that one of the greatest gifts you've ever been given of grace just has to be received. How ludicrous would it be for my brother to say, I got this. But that's what religion says. Religion says, I got this. And, and Jesus is saying, no, I came to deliver you. But you're trying to deliver yourself, and until you stop trying to deliver yourself, you will always be trying to do better about your sin with your sin and not receiving God's grace. And so you must stop trying and receive God's grace. But how do we receive it? We receive it by faith. And put up this last scripture, and then we're finished. This is what Paul said. Paul said in, in Ephesians 2, verse number 7, he says, that in the ages to come he might show you the exceeding, exceeding riches of his gra grace and kindness uh, toward us through the Lord Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, religion does a lot of boasting. But Jesus did a lot of sacrificing for you. And all we have to do is receive it. So here's, here's the takeaway. This is the takeaway. Receive God's grace from the penalty of sin and live in God's grace for the power over sin. Let me just tell you something. That in that scenario of my brother, you know, being completely helpless, completely useless, and in a state where he, he did not have the oxygen to survive. Most Christians are like that. They've been saved from their sin, but they haven't relied on grace to overcome the power of sin. The reality is until we stop trying to do it on our own, and by faith, be launched into the saving and power and grace of God, there's nothing we can do. And friend, you need to take the step of faith today and just receive the gift of grace. And if you've already received that gift of grace, friend, tomorrow at work, it's not you trying harder. It's you depending more. And it's the act of faith that will initiate the grace of God in your life. Thanks again for listening. If you would like to learn more about our church or how to get connected, check us out online at findnewlife.church or find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook under the handle Five New Life. Have an amazing day.